our God. We're going to look this, this evening, we're going to start with the, the largest possible way of considering God, and that is the universe, his creation. Psalm 30, verse 4, sing praise unto Jehovah, O ye saints of his, and give thanks to his memorial name. Let me see if I, if this is working here. Oh, you have to plug this in for this to work. <laughs> All right, now we're cooking with gas. <laughs> in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We believe that. It's a simple statement that starts out that wonderful piece of literature we call the scripture, God's word. It's a simple declaration that everything that we see in the book of nature comes from the hand and the mind of Jehovah, our creator. When you look at the skies on a clear night, you can see innumerable stars. Let me ask you a question. On a clear night without too much light pollution, how many stars do you think you could see? Give me a number. Well, between <laughs> well, between 2,000, 4,000, somewhere in there. It depends upon light pollution. You know, you get near a city, the, the light from the lights and whatnot makes the number of stars that you can see a lot less. I remember years ago, I, I, I grew up in the Northeast, uh, not too far from uh, larger metropolitan areas. But uh, when I was a Jehovah Witness, I went on a trip with uh, my best friend's father uh, to Iron Mountain, Michigan, to pick up a demonstrator garbage truck and drive it back to Rhode Island. You know, like a demonstrator, like a car, you know, it wasn't a Jaguar, it was a garbage truck. But we stopped in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan on our way back. We brought some sleeping bags and we camped out, slept on the top of this garbage truck. And I had never seen so many stars in my life. It's so dark up there in the Upper Peninsula. You know, you look and, wow, that's more stars than I could ever see. It was, it was amazing. I, I wonder, Brother Mark, do you, do you able to see stars at night from, you know, up at 38,000 feet, wherever you are? It must be even more spectacular up at those elevations. Huh? Wow. Well, if you, uh, if you take a pair of binoculars, you can increase the number of stars that you, you can see to about 217,000. By the way, don't ask me where these numbers come from. You know, you look it up and that's what they say. Uh, with, a, with a three inch telescope, you can see up to 5.3 million. By the way, this particular picture is a, a time-lapse picture of the Milky Way, the galaxy. And with the time-lapse picture, you can gather more and more light over a period of time and see more and more stars. Well, let's cut to the chase. How many stars are there? Well, that's a complicated question. But to answer the question, we have to go back and sort of look at things more locally. And I say locally with tongue in cheek. Here's a picture of a galaxy. A galaxy is a local collection of stars. The galaxy that we live in, which is called the Milky Way galaxy, is somewhat like this. It has bars and, and a uh, common center. It's a spiral galaxy. Uh, as is very common within the universe. There are many types of galaxies, but that's a fairly common one. The estimates run that there are from 100 billion to 400 billion stars in one galaxy. That's a lot of stars, isn't it? Isaiah the prophet, chapter 40, verse 26, lift up your eyes on high and see. Who created these things? Who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might? And because he is strong in power, not one is missing. That's pretty interesting. Jehovah has the stars numbered and named 100 to 400 billion in one galaxy. And Isaiah is not the only one to observe this. Psalm 147, verse 4, he gives the number of the stars. He gives to all of them their names. You know, I have a problem keeping straight the names of my five children sometimes. <laughs> Jehovah has named them all. We're going to have a poem read. Brother Bob Goodman is going to read this for us. It is entitled, God in Nature. 
And the words will be up for each verse there as he moves along. God in nature. The spacious firmament on high, with all the blue eth ethereal sky, and spangled heavens a shining frame, their great original proclaim. The unwearied sun from day to day does its creator's power display and publishes to every land the work of the almighty hand. Soon as the evening shades prevail, the moon takes up the wondrous tale and nightly to the listening earth repeats the story of her birth. While all the stars that round her burn and all the planets in their turn confirm the tidings as they roll and spread the truth from pole to pole. What though in solemn silence all move round this dark terrestrial ball, what though no real voice nor sound amid their radiant orbs be found. In reason's ear they all rejoice and utter forth a glorious voice, forever singing as they shine, the hands that made us his divine. Thank you very much, Brother Bob. I don't know if you ever thought about it or not, but when Adam was created, when he looked up in the sky, what did he see? Probably not much. Remember the firmament of the heaven, the Valian uh, theory that described? None of those pre-flood uh, individuals saw the stars like you and I see the stars. Can you imagine after the flood, Noah and his family coming out and looking, oh my gracious God, what is this? And you know, the taking away of that firmament enabled man, of course, many centuries later, to be able to probe the depths of the universe and understand things. Psalm 19, verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. What a simple statement from David, a psalm. You can sort of feel his awe at looking at creation, at the heavenly creation, and saying, yes, this is the God I serve. Let's sing together a hymn. How great thou art. The, the uh, words will be up here, so you don't need to pull out your hymn books or your iPhones.
consider the immenseness of this universe, we think about the eternal power and immensity of our God, we can't help but praise him. You know, we all want to give glory to God. Here's a practical question for you. How do you glorify God? You know, many years ago, uh, in a convention in Chicago, Brother David Rice's father, Brother Gilbert, gave a definition of what it means to glorify God. And I've never forgotten it because I thought it was a very workable definition. We glorify God by raising somebody else's opinion of God a little bit. Isn't that practical? You can do it, as we said yesterday, with a smile, with a word of help, always letting know that God is behind your goodwill and your good wishes for everyone. And they will think better of God and you will have glorified God thereby. Let's go back to our galaxy for a moment. Remember we said that there was 100 to 400 billion stars in the galaxy. Well, this is just one galaxy. When you go outside and look, all of the stars that you see in the sky are off from our galaxy. With the naked eye, you can't see hardly any other galaxies. There's one or two that just come very close to being able to perceive. But most of what you say, by far the majority, is just stars within our own galaxy. Well, how many galaxies are there? Here's a picture that has become kind of a classic picture. This is the Hubble telescope, and it's the deep field picture taken by uh, Hubble oh, many years ago now. Every da dash of light that you see on that picture is a galaxy. You don't see any stars there. They are all galaxies. You know, if we had a good high resolution, you'd look and you'd, you could see these little spiral galaxies and elliptical and spherical, and but it's all galaxies. Now, when it took that picture, how large a field did it take? Well, do this with me. Put your fingers together like this. Okay? Hold it at arm's length. That's it. That's the field that you are looking at that Hubble took. And you can see right away, what part of the sky is that little bit? It's such an infinitesimal part of the sky. And yet look, all of these galaxies. There are billions of galaxies and uh, opinions vary on just how many there are. As they begin to develop the technology to see further and deeper, both optically and by radio telescope and other means, they see more and more. And what's really interesting is that when you are looking at light that's coming from a great distance, you are looking back in time. I can't tell you how far away these galaxies are, but let's just say that they average, let's say 10 million light years away. Now I'm just making a, a covered average here. But what that means, dear friends, is that's how they looked 10 million years ago. Because a light year is a distance of how much light travels in one year. So when you get a photon that's one comes one light year, you're seeing a photon like it looked one year ago. So you're looking into the distant past. It's just wonderful, absolutely wonderful. Psalm 8, verses 3 and 4. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? You can see the psalmist had a great devotion and deep reverence for God. And he looked at what he could see and understand from, what, 3,000 years ago? And he says, my goodness, this, our God is done. What, what are we? Little pieces of protoplasm. Well, he didn't use the word protoplasm. <laughs> but little pieces of flesh on this earth. He just was absolutely amazed. We have much to be thankful and, and praiseful to our Heavenly Father. We've been looking at the universe, far distance galaxies. Let's bring it back to the earth. This beautiful blue planet that exists. As scientists have developed uh, astronomical inspection, they have found planets that revolve around the sun. This is relatively recent, let's say in the past 10, 15 years. They could never detect planets running around stars because it was too distant. But now they've developed a the technology that they, that they have. 
they haven't found anything like an Earth-like planet yet. Most of the planets they have found have been very large, like Jupiter, easier to see, of course, with the equipment that they have. But they haven't come close to finding something as beautiful as Earth, or a place that comes close that could support life. Here's an interesting scripture, Isaiah 40, verse 2. He, it is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in. Who told Isaiah that it was a circle? Now, you might say, well, he stood on a far mountain and he go all the way around. Well, that's true enough. But isn't it interesting? He uses that word, and from outside the earth, we see this beautiful sphere. Not only that, here's what Job has to say. He stretches out the north over the void and hangs the earth on nothing. They didn't understand gravitational fields. They didn't understand the orbits. But he did understand through inspiration that the earth was by itself. I've got nothing. All right, we're going to make a change now. We're going to go from this wonderful universe. We're going to come into the earth. And we're going to come on the earth right down to the level of living creatures. And we're going to go to the level of living creatures right down to the cells in your body, from the largest to the smallest now. Now, this next slide, I want you to tell me what it is you see. Are you ready? A motor, an electric motor to be precise. We use electric motors in our world every day. Almost every part of uh, kitchen appliances have a motor of some kind. Here's a breakdown of what it looks like. Very quickly, they call this the stator. This uh, generates a uh, rotating electric field, at least for an AC motor. And down here you have a rotor. So as the electric field moves around, it drags the rotor and it produces the rotation, which makes the electric motor. And we think, wow, what a marvel of our time that, that, that scientists have come up with it. Actually, specifically, Nikola Tesla came up with the AC motor. Now let's look at something else. This is a one-celled creature. Uh, maybe you've heard the term paramecium or euglena. But these one-cell creatures, they are able to move around within their environment by means of this. This is called a flagellum. And the flagellum rotates. And it can rotate very fast and propel the creature along. Now, what do you think runs that rotation? Here's a close-up. Does that look familiar? It is an electric motor. Absolutely. Here's a little bit closer look at it. Now, all of these parts here, these are microscopic. These are molecules that have been put together in order to produce the electric fields through chemical action. But it's got a rotor and a stator, just like electric motors that we have in our technology today. And these one-celled microscopic animals have what we consider today high technology an electric motor. Worthy are you, our God and our Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. You created all things, and because of your will, they existed. Brethren, let's sing another hymn. This time we're going to sing Boundless Grace. Yes, him 37, I'm sorry, sure. <laughs>
Now we looked at a one-celled animal that exists uh, within nature, but we'd like to show you something that exists within you, within each of your cells. The general picture of a, of a cell. You've got a cell membrane on the outside that retains all the material. You have a nucleus that contains the genetic material that allows the, the cell both to, uh, op uh, to operate and to reproduce and a lot of other very, very neat things. But there's something in the cells of, of most animals, most living things, something called a kinesin. Say it with me, kinesin. It's a little machine that exists in your cells. By the way, how many cells would you say that you have in your body? Anyone want to hazard that guess? How? It, it, Brother Brian's using the number of stars, you know. Actually, it's much, much, 37 trillion, depending upon. And by the way, most of those cells are you. A lot of them are not you. It's bacteria and whatnot that we have in our body that, that helps us to live and to digest and things like that. I think somebody said it's like four pounds of, uh, of things that are not you, you know, within your body. But still, however, you've got 37 trillion cells. So I'm going to play a little video here for you. And uh, there should be some sound with this, and hopefully it'll be loud enough for everyone to hear. But I think you'll be astonished when you see this and know that this is part of what God has made for your body to function. Whoops, didn't want to do that. Sorry. There we go. This is an animation, by the way, of what's in there. Cells are full of specialized components that perform functions vital to their existence. But how do these components get to the right locations inside the cell to perform their functions? For larger components, a transportation system is needed. Meet the kinesin. Masterpieces of microengineering, kinesins are miniature motorized machines that carry cargo from one part of the cell to another walking along self-assembling highways called microtubules. Known as the workhorses of the cell, kinesins have two feet, or globular heads, that literally walk one foot over another along the microtubule, pulling their cargo to its destination. Each foot possesses two special locations, called binding sites, that interact with other molecules. One site attaches to the microtubule, and the other binds with ATP, the energy molecule of the cell. When one foot binds with ATP and uses its energy, the foot flips over, resulting in the walking motion. Each foot has a short neck, which is connected to a strand of a long coiled stalk. At the end of the stalk is a fan-shaped tail, which holds tightly to the cargo being transported. Kinesins can carry cargo that are many times their own size. Sometimes a kinesin is in danger of getting stuck on the microtubule highway because of blockages caused by other cellular components. Get around such obstacles, multiple motor proteins may be used to carry a single piece of cargo, together providing enough force to break free. Kinesins typically walk away from the center of the cell and toward the cell's periphery. The kinesins' two feet work together efficiently, with one foot holding fast to the microtubule, while the other releases itself and takes a step forward. This coordinated stepwise movement allows kinesin motors to walk as many as 100 steps per second, moving about 8 nanometers with each step. When not carrying cargo, Kinesins can shift to energy-saving mode to conserve fuel until their next job. The kinesin plays a vital role in many cellular processes, not just transporting materials, but also aiding cell replication. The walking kinesin molecular machine, another example of intelligent design. You think about that. Astonishing. Isn't it? 
and you know, we said there's 37 trillion cells in our bodies. So how many kinesins per cell? That's a lot of little motors. You know, you can think of a cell as a factory. There's a lot of things going on. It's got input, it's got output. You know, I've worked in several factories in my life and you have to get materials from one place to another. Unfinished material to the operational building process, manufacturing process, and then finished material, finished goods out. Well, that's what the kinesins do within itself. Rather, this is not part of our, uh, uh, of our presentation tonight to talk about evolution. But do you think that this could have come about by accident, by trial and error? No. And it's one of many, many, many examples. Brethren, let's have another poem read. We're going to ask Brother Alan Springer to come forth and read a poem entitled, How Strong and Sweet My Father's Care. How strong and sweet my father's care, the words like music in the air, come answering to my whispered prayer, he cares for thee. The thought great wonder with it brings, my cares are all such little things, but to this truth my glad faith clings, he cares for me. Yea, keep me ever in thy love, dear father, watching from above, and let me still thy mercy prove and care for me. Cast me not off because of sin, but make me pure and true within, and teach me how thy smile to win, who cares for me. O oh, still in summer's golden glow, or wintry storms of wind and snow, love me, my Father, let me know thy care for me. And I will learn to cast the care which like a heavy load I bear down at thy feet in lowly prayer and trust in thee for naught can hurt me shade or shine nor evil thing touch me nor mine since thou with tenderness divine dost care for me like the psalmist said what is man that you that you care for us that you deal with us we're astonished when we look at what God has created in this universe. There are beauties that are hard to describe. It's so nice that we have in this day and age photographs that we can see what others have seen. You know, in ancient times, all you had to rely upon was a verbal description. You know, when they began to do oil paintings and, and other paintings like that, that started to describe it a little bit. But we have such wonderful things that are part of our world. John 16, 27. For the Father himself loveth you, because ye have loved me, and have believed that I came out, of, out from God. John 15, 12. This is my commandment, that ye love one another, as I have loved you. We have a God whose intellect is beyond description. But in answer to the psalmist's question, how is it that God cares for us? We don't need to answer how, we just know that he does. And in your experiences, all of your experiences, you have seen God's tenderness at various times in your life, so pronounced, so sweet. They're just at the time that you need it. God is a very careful accounting of what happens in our lives. Remember the scripture, all things work together. So he knows what you need when you need it, and provides it. And brethren, we can be like our God by watching our brethren closely, by studying our brethren closely, not sticking our nose in their affairs, but watching what their needs are and being there to meet their needs. You probably are going to be going to do God's will when you do that, but then that shows your love for them. It makes sure that you understand God's love for them through their uh, through their love for you. Brethren, we've, we've reached near the end here of our Vesper service, and we're going to do something that brethren like very much. We're going to look at a lot of old photos of brethren that you love very much. And we're going to start out by singing Christian Fellowship hymn. And uh, we're going to sing that, and we will run out of hymn before we run out of photos, so Sister Cheryl may continue to play very lightly. But let's start out the Christian fellowship.
for many of these brethren you may recognize the names without recognizing the uh, brethren many of you remember sister alpha Guterma. we have brother art cook charles smith charles thornton and brother leon herman hummel brother john there's your dad <laughs> wilbur poe and sister Cole. And Sister Gannon, I didn't know them. Dawn Side Maker, any remember the Gannons? This was not a name that I had. Mary and Lee on Norby, State Fair Witness 1964. 1968, Mackinac Island Convention, Mark Thornton, Lee on Norby, our beloved brother Bravely. Same convention. Paula, Vicki, Lydia, Esther, and Paul Bach. Richard, Anna Mae, and Rick. <laughs> I'm amazed at how much Rick today looks like his father. Huh? By the way, coming from the Northeast, we gather these mostly from Northeast brethren, so the brethren from the West Coast uh, don't have too much there. Down in Florida, though, you'll see a few more, I think. Brother Gloria and Art Luce, who in later years moved up to uh, upstate New York and uh, had the East Coast Bible camp at their, at their farm for many, many years. Sister Ruth, Joe and Seal Michka. We knew them when they were at Patterson before they retired down here to Florida. Many of you know them well. Faith, there you are. <laughs> Sister Felicia, Sister Monte. Ruth and Jean Burns in Taze, Benjamin, 1968. 68 Atlantic City, Sister Sandy. <laughs> Her aunt, Sister Joyce Bateman, probably not many of you knew Sister Joyce, but what a saint, outstanding saint. John Moore and Sister Carmela. Brother and Sister Fry, you've heard the name, no doubt. Well, there's what they look like. Don't know the name of the sister to their left. If anybody knows, let me know. David Dinwiddie and Brother Bernd Eckholt, who served this uh, convention many times. Tom and Ruth Ballard, dear brethren to uh, all of you. Tom and Jan Gilbert. Tom and Jan are uh, Kathy and my age, you know, now we're getting to my generation. Len Boyer and Rush Shalhoub. August and Louise Tornquist. Dear brethren, wonderful servants of the Lord, and not only spiritual matters, but many physical needs of the brethren. Brother August and Sister Louise were outstanding. Bill and Mary Geisinger and Sister Marcia. Levi and Sister Jacobs. 
You remember talks by Brother Levi, don't you? Wow. <laughs> the Destros. John and Esther Tresiak. Barbara Thornton and Brother Ray. Frank Chalou, Charles of Hartford. Burnett Colt, Chester was the one. Brother, Brother Chester is the one that brought Brother Burnett Colt into the truth. They work together. I love this picture. Brethren, let's close with Psalm 148, 1 through 6. Praise ye Jehovah. Praise ye Jehovah from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise ye him, all his angels. Praise ye him, all his host. Praise ye him, sun and moon. Praise him, all ye stars of light. Praise him, ye heaven of heavens. And ye waters that are above the heavens, let them praise the name of Jehovah, for he commanded, and they were created. Brethren, we have an awesome creator.